the impediments are people's minds. People's beliefs are determined by our culture, and our culture is now determined by money, and money is what controls media, money controls the advertisements, money controls social media. It's a machine that skews our values. Hi, Vicki Robin here, host of What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute, in which we interview cultural scouts, people who see far and serve the common good, asking them each our one question with all that seems to be going awry, what could possibly go right? And my guest today is Paul Hawken, who is an environmentalist, an entrepreneur, a best-selling author of eight books that have been published in 30 languages in more than 50 countries, and have sold more than 2 million copies. Hawken is a renowned lecturer who has keynoted conferences and led workshops on the impact of commerce on the environment and has consulted with governments and corporations throughout the world. So here's Paul Hawken. Hey, Paul, uh, so good to see you. Um, I've known you since I discovered the book Seven Tomorrows in the 1980s. And we met around the time that you wrote Natural Capitalism, and you invited me to speak at the Natural Step Conference. And again and again, you've offered us a context we can live into. Uh, you like point the way, you don't tell us the right way. So, you know, 40 years, we've each been on a long journey to turn the tide away from degeneration to regeneration. And I think this whole time has been sort of like Dickens. It's the best of times and the worst of times. And now we are in this narrow shoot of having fossil fuels, have, having H-A-L-V-I-N-G, fossil fuel burning, uh, the feedstock of our way of life by 2030 and then having it again in, in a decade and then again and again until we get off this source of uh, energy for our civilization. And I will admit that my confidence that we can turn the tide in time to save all that we love has dwindled, even though I know it's possible and doable if everyone, every institution, every level of scale had a change of mind and heart. And I think this is what you're energizing through getting us all to focus on and fall in love with and believe in um, life's persistent strategy of regeneration. So I'm going to throw out some questions that are just on my mind that I grapple with, and you can speak to them or not. You can just completely blow them off. You are free to go where you will. So there's about five of them. And so your book came out nearly six months ago. And so what has surprised you since? And then can the systems we have, like capitalism and political capture by corporate interests, step up or step aside so that reason and regeneration can prevail? Or how do these impediments that are have a deep bench and a lot of money <laughs> um, uh, actually get out of our way? And then another one is, regener is regeneration inherently local and place-based? Is it more like the Via Campesina than the Farm Bill or a managed economy like China? Um, your ground seems to be that it's a networked world where everyone has influence in all the nested context of their lives. So, you know, and this may be sort of out of my despair, but this bottom up add up, that's a question. And uh, another one is how does mitigation and adaptation fit into your thought, accepting what we cannot change? Or is it more like we are changing over time, not changing in time? And in the years since we've known each other, windows have opened and closed and opened and closed. So what windows are opening now that you see even at this late date? So my friend, thanks for sitting through my questions and over to you, what could possibly go right? Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> good questions. Thank you for those. <laughs> um, some of those are what I call Wizard of Oz questions, which is that if I have the temerity to answer them in a way that uh, demonstrates or uh, that I think I know, uh, you should run. <laughs> because, 
they're, they're not really answerable. They're good questions. Doesn't just because some is not answerable doesn't mean it's not a good question, by the way. Um, you know, what is life? I mean, it's a really, really good question. Okay. No one's answered that one yet. And so, uh, I want to, I'm complimenting the questions. Um, I would say that, um, going to the title, you know, what could go right. I'm more interested in what is going right, not what could go right. Mm -hmm. Uh, because what could go right is determined by what is not what we imagine could be. Um, now imagination is, is definitive in terms of, um, what we do and what we choose, what we purpose, what we, you know, uh, 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 orient our lives towards, you know, I mean, if it's not there, the imagination is not there, then, you know, it's too bad. But I mean, I have said that what we face um, is a problem of imagination, you know, not skill, not technique, not tools, not engineering, uh, not practice, it's actually imagination is what's lacking. And uh, so, um, so it's very, very important. But with, I'm more interested in what is going right. And, and looking to see if that is an augury, if those are, you know, um, indica indicators of, um, of possibilities that uh, are going to scale uh, or not, and in time or not. Um, so those are the, those are the things that that I always try to not always, but I often uh, ponder. The, the question about systems, you know, comes up again and again, you know, like these huge overlighting systems like capitalism. Um, these have deep, deep, deep histories and legacies. Um, and uh, I have several attitudes about that. One is that capitalism doesn't really exist. It's just a word. Uh, <laughs> And it came after the fact, you know, I mean, the economic system that it describes was already here and nobody had a name for it. And so just because we give it a name doesn't mean that everything we do economically, uh, you know, is fits within that name. Uh, and so I make a distinction between commerce and capitalism. Uh, commerce is ancient, and I would dare say sacred. Uh, it's, it's, it goes back, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of years between human beings. It's extraordinary. Um, when, um, I mean, th there's so many examples of, of us finding artifacts in archaeological digs and so forth for cultures that are long gone, um, that, uh, could not have, did not arise from that place. They came from thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away. And they got there by commerce, by trade, by barter, by, you know, people meeting and, and the core of commerce is things like credit, which is to believe and trust. It's, that's the, that's the core values of commerce. Capitalism is something different altogether. And that is the pursuit to try to uh, basically increase capitalism. And what I say about capitalism, when asked, is that um, I kind of paraphrase G.K. Chesterton, who w was once asked the same question about Christianity. And he said, uh, I said, I think it's a great idea. No one's tried it yet. <laughs> and so when I think of capitalism, I think, you're talking about financialism, you're talking about moneyism, you know, not like capitalism. Otherwise, you include natural capital, and social capital, and intellectual capital, you know, all the forms of capital that exist on this planet, not just, you know, fiat money. And so we are in a system that, you know, unquestionably, where, uh, according to Thomas Piketty, the great French economist and scholar who wrote the book Capital, um, which is too long to read, but very, very important to get the points from, which is that capital split off from productivity 200 years ago. In other words, capital was increased by people doing more work. And when they did more work, they could produce more. When they produced more, the price went down and then income went up. And, you know, that's the spiral of industrialism. Um, but 200 years ago, capital started to just do those things that made capital grow, not productivity. Uh, and, uh, and that is 
uh, quintessentially where we are now, where you look at the markets, the New York Stock Exchange, but other markets, and you see the valuations and what things are worth. And it's just hysterically funny if it wasn't tragic. Um, and those, those creations of money then has to go somewhere. And what it's going to is housing. People are buying up tracks of suburban housing, you know, speculating, and then the rents go up. And, you know, as capital concentrates, the poor get poorer. And this is what's happening. And it's, it's really, really heinous in a way. And yet, uh, that's the system we're in. Um, but I see, uh, I don't see that as just black and white. Uh, uh, I'll give an example. We're talking about regeneration, but the book and, and what I'm focused on, but, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world uh, is devoted to regenerating their whole supply chain. And that'd be Nestle, the biggest food company in the world, who certainly have had their share of doing things in the past that were, you know, basically like, I don't know what the right description is, uh, but really, really um, harmful. You know, there's no other word for it, you know, uh, to African women on, on baby formula. And, you know, I, I mean, just the, you know, they've made mistakes. They've, this is three, four CEOs later now today. Um, they know <laughs> what they did and how, um, unfortunate it was and what a terrible mistake in judgment, all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and as they say themselves, you know, mud sticks. And so, you know, so it still sticks to them. But if you really look at what they're doing right now, as opposed to what was done 20 years ago, uh, um, where they're moving to is is fascinating and they're moving to uh, ancient ingredients nutrition uh, they're selling off their plastic water bottle companies uh, you see you still see nestle water but that somebody got the brand name for a while then the brand goes off um, they're selling off their candy bar companies you know ba baby Ru babe ruth and buddy fingers and things like that and they are committed to um, transitioning all one million farms that are in their supply chain to regenerative agriculture the real deal too and um and they budgeted a billion and a half dollars to help the farmers make that transition and six hundred thousand of them are smallholders and the other are more row crops like corn soy wheat etc and um what's interesting about that to me is that they discovered it because they looked at their carbon commitments in 2040 their net zero commitments and they are committing to net zero by 2040. And then they looked at that and said, well, over 60% of them come from farms, you know? And we do know that farm and ag together, farm, ag and food, excuse me, together are 35% of global emissions. And so um, they looked at the farming practices, but as they looked at it, they also looked at it from, from the point of view of the future, which is a climate is where there's too much water, too little water, too hot, too cold. In other words, a more disruptive climate uh, landscape. And, and so what they're doing is very pragmatic, which is they've been around 150 years. They want to be around for another 150 years. That's their job. That's management. That's what that's, they serve their shareholders. And, so the idea is like, well, let's stick around. That would be a good idea. So to do that, you know, they're working with a million farmers, you know, and and they have everything from cacao and, you know, coffee to, you know, regular row crops. I mean, and I don't know how many countries, 80 countries where they have farming operations. They don't own them. They just, they just buy from those farms. So there's an example of a company and their motto right now is generation v generation and they're dead to write serious about this. I know the people, I work with them and they get it, they understand it and they won't, they're not gonna, you know, toot their horn, but that's exactly what they're doing. So that's quote, quote, capitalism. But to me, it's just a 150 year old company that, um, it, you know, is changing and is changing and adapting to a new landscape, a new social landscape, a new um, climatic landscape. Um, and a new landscape in terms of people's values. Um, and um, so the head of the company came from healthcare. And so there's, there's an interesting um, 
uh, uh, you know, in a sense, change in their direction uh, to nutrition in, in the truest sense of the word, you know, as opposed to ultra processed foods, which is 60% of the American diet is ultra processed foods, which are basically chemical experiments on humankind because they're not food at all. Um, and so, um, so I can give you many other examples of companies that are doing extraordinary things. They function within an existing uh, capitalist system, if you want to call it that, but, you know, financial system and markets and, you know, pension funds and investors and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I think the change, um, Vicky, that I, that I see is that you have CEOs who up until relatively recently uh, would espouse green things or sustainability or, you know, say the right things, have a department. Um, but in a sense, they were just getting their social license renewed from a changing customer base. And they knew that if they didn't do X and Y and Z, that the customers would complain or move away to another product or, you know, out them publicly on social media and things like that. So you see a lot of corporations that have, you know, moving, 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 or saying the right things and not really doing it, but, you know, and what you see now today, and I've seen it, I mean, literally, and that is, is you have CEOs, uh, women and men, uh, who get it. And what I mean by that is they get it. They have children or nieces and nephews or grandchildren or whatever. And they see the writing on the wall, the climate wall, if you will. Or the, and you see it in their eyes. I mean, it's not like, it's not conceptual, you know, like, oh yeah, we got to do this and this and, you know, and, um, and find themselves at that point of realization at, in, at being the head of a company, consumer goods or production or manufacturing or service company and going, wait a minute, I can't responsibly stay here in this role and not move this company for which I am responsible in a way that isn't amenable to what we know about the future, you know, that doesn't comport and conform to what needs to be done by this institution, you know, scope one, scope two, scope three emissions as are known. And so you're seeing that and that's, that's like, you know, they, they they know they have to work within an existing system. They they may have these you know completely huge, gnarly, amazing supply chains. Um, it's complex, um, but what's good about them is they're not leaving. You know they're not saying, "Oh man, this this company sucks," uh, or you know I don't know what to do with this thing. It's a behemoth. You know it's too big. To... <laughs> they're they're staying and they're working and they're doing, okay. and they're not crowing about it. They're not doing you know, public service announcements are not trying to get brownie points, you know, from the public or youth or whatever, they're actually doing it. And so you don't hear much about them. Um, because they know that the do is the most important thing not to say. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something I'd say about capitalism. Is it a functional system? No, it's quintessentially dysfunctional. Uh, and its value orientation is upside down and backwards and the results show uh, in everywhere in the world today. Uh, and it is also, I think, skewing um, uh, human beings in terms of uh, their values, because in a sense, there is kind of like a, a roulette wheel out there, not maybe a roulette wheel, but a uh, maybe a lottery, you know, is a better word where maybe if I do this and this and this, you know, I can make enough money, I'll be safe. Or I'll be, you know, from the future, you know, I'll have enough property or a big enough house or a big enough portfolio. I don't know what people are thinking, you know, and you see that with crypto now too, cryptocurrency, you know, you're seeing the same mindset, even though it's about DeFi, you know, in a sense of so decentralized, you know, finance, you know, uh, getting uh, out of, you know, fiat, you know, money and the control that central banks and, you know, money center banks have. And that's the promise of cryptocurrency. 
I so you know, but you're seeing the same in mindset in of whales, you know, people making tons of money and so forth, and being super rich. And so it has nothing to do really with a change in core values, uh, as to what is valuable in and in, in what is uh, what is a, a, a way for humanity to work together in such a way that everybody uh, uh, is needs are supported in a way that allows them to be fully human uh, as mothers, fathers, children, uncles, aunts, whatever. And we are f moving further away from that. And so I don't see crypto um, doing anything about that either. Um, but um, so that's the, the impediments are people's minds, you know, and um, people's beliefs are um, determined by our culture and our culture is now determined by money and money is what controls media, money controls the advertisements, money controls social media. People can say whatever they want and think whatever they want on social media, but the ads don't. And basically that adage, you know, if it's free, you're the product. And so whether it's Insta, Facebook or whatever else, you know, you're being sold, you're being sold to others, you know. And uh, so, you know, every little iota of information that you in unintentionally offer basically goes to people who parse it and then come back and try to sell you something. So it's really a consumption machine. And also it's a machine that skews our values, you know, as to what is valuable. And so the lionization of influencers, oh, this influencer, influencer is making 10 million a year, doing what? Nothing, except, you know, dancing on TikTok and, and basically showing different clothing or dresses and so forth, basically abetting fast fashion, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, it's out this week, it's, it's, this is in next week, you know? And, and you know, um, it, it's just, it's, 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 I mean, again, if I, if it wasn't so tragic, it'd be hilarious, you know, I mean, accepting that has a huge impact on young people, it has a huge impact on the environment. Clothing now is at least 8% of global emissions. And, uh, and so, uh, and 30% of uh, fa f fine fashion, or that is true fashion, is thrown away. Um, to keep the prices high, you know, they make the clothing and the purses and then they throw them away if they don't sell. They don't sell them. They don't go into secondary markets because uh, that would ruin the price, that would ruin the, the, the perception of value. <laughs> and so you have a whole industry, you know, even H&M, oh, I think, was a, uh, burned a bunch of clothes until they got caught at it in the local incinerator in Sweden to produce power for the city. <laughs> they were burning tens and tens of millions of dollars of clothing, you know, they didn't sell, you know. So, um, so I'm just saying is that, you know, and then you have Twitter, which is to me, it's not a Twitter verse, it's a, it's, it's a ridiculous verse uh, of opinion, belief and outing and, you know, sarcastic, you know, stiletto um, things taken out to skew other people's beliefs and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And again, all these things really are are the digitization of our minds and so forth you know has produced this sort of uh fractioning and and you know splintering of uh um i mean i saw a preview for a movie that's coming out it's called moonfall i think moonfall where the, the moon explodes and it falls down on earth okay that's the, as much as i got of the plot but i mean you can see that in our media like that we're projecting our you know our our, our our darker self you know or self at all you know i mean our our, our uh it's hard to say what it is you know but you see it being projected out like the moon's going to explode you know and what an interesting interesting uh archetype you know for a movie um but it's emblematic of what's happening to our spirit our souls our hearts our minds our communities you know and they are exploding and fracturing and dividing um, so the biggest impediment I see in terms of uh, regeneration, rege re regenerating the world and so forth, is um, both a, 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 a torment and a, and a gift, if you will, an offering, and, and that is that uh, we're producing a world uh, that's meaningless. And we strive to, cry, to cover that up, you know, uh, 
with all sorts of news stories and, you know, all sorts of social media and products and this and that and, you know, stars and, you know, Kanye and, you know, Kardashians and, you know, we just, just an onslaught of things that are distractions, you know, and take us away from ourself. Um, but the, the good thing about all that is that it is creating a sense of meaninglessness and purpose, purple, less purposelessness, excuse me. Um, and we know that 70% of the, you know, 16 to 20, three, four uh, year old cohort in the United States, um, is depressed. Now, clinically, no, because I haven't all been to clinics. Um, and uh, but depressed and the number one cause of depression is lack of purpose in other words my life has no purpose and they look at the world if they have you know just basic intelligence they look at it and the only conclusion you could draw from that is that this world is mad and it has no purpose it has no meaning uh, it's not dignified it's not kind it's not compassionate it's not inclusive uh, it's not supportive um and um and that just reifies that sense of you know lack of meaning that people have that children have that young people have i'm not saying there aren't some amazingly brave wonderful young people marching acting doing something they're incredible so but i'm just saying overall you know um that's where we are and i think the thing about regeneration regeneration is really about you know restoring life on earth which in itself sounds like an overwhelming task but i'll get back to that but the fact is that uh, regeneration is what provides a sense of purpose meaning and dignity to people's lives everywhere in the world and the climate conversation as i read it hear it watch it uh, uh is still a conversation amongst the privilege to the privilege it's over the, the one or two percent talking to each other with some outliers, you know, lobbying and some grenades and books and things, you know, but basically, you know, when you think what, what you can do, what you can do depends on you having a lot to do with. That is that you're well off, that, you know, you're, you're secure, you have a home, you know, you have a mortgage, you know, maybe you don't even have a mortgage, maybe you own your home and you have, you know, I want to get rid of one of my cars. One of your cars, most people don't have a car. It's like, you know, I'm gonna buy a Tesla, you know, it's like, I mean, this is a conversation that is exclusive of most of the people in the world. And so um, what's interesting about regeneration is that it's innate to being a human being. In other words, it's not a concept. Now the word may be a concept for people, granted, no question about that. But it's not like um, sustainability was a concept, which still is, you know. Define it. What does it mean? When do you teach it? When do you achieve it? How do you know? Who's to say? Huh? Good questions. Um, so it's a concept. And the climate science, if you will, has been a conceptual matter for the overwhelming number of people in the world. Like, in, if you go down and do a woman or man in the street thing with a fake microphone, and saying, oh, I'm just doing a survey, I'm just doing, <laughs> hi, my name is Vicki Robbins, and so forth. What does 1.5C mean to you? 1.5C mean to you? And they'll look at you like, who is this woman? Why? <laughs> and they'll say, oh, yeah, maybe oh, I've heard of that. Yeah. Uh, C, what's C? <laughs> is that a centigrade? Oh, uh, yeah, is that? Is that the way other people do temperature? Because we don't do that here. We do F. Where's that? And, and one five C of what? And where? And when? And I mean, people have no idea. That's just jargon. And it's just climate speak. And it has no meaning for people. And so we continue to use climate speak as a way to talk about it. Decarbonization. Oh, that really works. How about negative emissions? Oh, fabulous, you know. I mean, I'm an English major, and when people say negative emissions, I'm going, what's a negative tree? There's no such thing as a negative emission. It's an impossibility. That's like saying, you know, it's a negative rock. Well, it doesn't exist. That's a negative rock. It's like we're using language which is so contorted and, and guaranteed to turn people off and to make them oblivious to the content 
Um, and we have expected people to act or to do something or to become responsible or to, you know, uh, with that kind of uh, dialogue. And then not to mention acronyms, you know. Oh, the IPCC, you know, a function of the UNFCC has come up. I mean, you know, it's like, whoa, wait, can't stop. What do you mean? Who, what? The... And so um, the conversation is, is not inclusive. And, and so you go back to regeneration. I say it's innate to being a human being is that all 30, 40 trillion cells, you know, there's different numbers for the number of cells we have in our body are regenerating every millisecond right now. Yours are, mine are, or we wouldn't be having this conversation. It's, it's what the cells do to live. And it's the default mode of life. Life regenerates started 3 billion years ago with something coming out of the ocean and, you know, and, basically <laughs> a bacteria, you know, in the ocean and combining um, uh, with a bit of speckled, you know, um, uh, what was it, lichen and, you know, forming the basis for soil. And, you know, it's just, it, you look at 3 billion years and all during that time, Ice Age is notwithstanding, uh, in terms of the periodicity and the pulsing of it, life has created life. You know, we had the Cenozoic, we had the meteor, life was wiped out. Look what happened in 65 million years, you know, we had 10 million species, you know. And so this is what life does, and we're life. And so our natural proclivity is to generate life. And we know this because everything we do in a day, including to ourselves, is about, uh, we care for things, we care for ourselves, of course, you know, we take a shower, we brush our teeth, you know, we make our bed, you know, we, but we, we take care of our children, our friends, you know, uh, our elderly parents, our, our, our neighbors, you know, uh, our congregants at the church or temple synagogue or, or where we go, you know, um, you know, where we celebrate. Uh, if we're teachers, we take care of our students, you know, we take, I mean, we take care. And then we do other things that are stupid, but we always take care, even the most right wing, angry, you know, arm to the teeth person in Idaho is taking care of his dogs. <laughs> it's like, so I'm just saying you can't get rid of that quality. That's regeneration, caring for life, you know, in all its manifestations. And so we do understand that, as you said, you know, that we have to decrease our fossil fuel dependence and usage, you know, combustion, really, uh, of coal, gas, and oil by, you know, 45, 50% by 2030, and again in 2040, and, uh, and then really zero out by 2050. That's so true. 85% of, of uh, our greenhouse gases on carbon dioxide are from combustion of coal, gas, and oil. But What's happened is that we kind of think that, you know, that if we do that, we get a hall pass, you know, to the 22nd century. And it's not true because um, we have to look at, well, where are we consuming that? What are we doing with it? Why are we combusting it at all? You know, and then you go to fast fashion or clothing being 8%. You go to ag and food, that's 35% of global emissions and greenhouses is how we farm and what we eat and how we make what we eat. Uh, and then you have to also look at the fact that every living system on Earth is declining and declining is speeding up. Um, and so we have to step back and look at the fact that we could be zero emissions today. In other words, we could have uh, no more fossil fuels, but the way we're uh, uh, acting, the way we are producing, the way we are interacting with the environment is destroying life on Earth. And you can, um, uh, um, you know, you can run a chainsaw in the Amazon in the Oshawa territory on renewable energy with batteries just as easily as with gasoline or two cycle motor. So we have to step back and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not like we just have the wrong fuel source. We do. No question, we got to address that. It's, uh, it's unquestionable, but but in a sense, you know, we've narrowed down, you know, this the idea of where the leverage is to the exclusion of so many other things. You know, 
And so regeneration, the book certainly, and the website and so forth, really is uh, is not really, but is 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 the complete listing and uh, and network of climate solutions in the world. But it's how to do them, not here's the list, you know, take a pick. Um, and it's still in development on the website. The book's not uh, books out as you said six months, but. The website is, and it's sort of wiki curated, and you'll see a nexus, you know, like take degraded land restoration, you know, which is a huge, huge area of uh, potential carbon sequestration and uh, um, um, bringing back life, you know, to areas that have been deforested or um, uh, overgrazed or burnt uh, or uh, industrially farmed and abandoned. It's 2 billion hectares, it's a lot of land, that's 5 billion acres, and it's just sitting there waiting to be regenerated, to be restored, to be renewed, to be rejuvenated. We know how to do it, we know how to do it. And it brings back creatures and insects and biodiversity and water and fertility and food, and it employs people and gives them, like again, a sense of purpose and meaning to see a land return from, uh, uh, from being a desert, to return back to what it once was is an amazing job if you call that even a job at all i mean and and so we're you know we have a, a way of looking at climate and regeneration that's completely different than this idea that somehow we have to get an ev now evs are fine um i'm not decrying them at all but i'm just saying is that there's so much more that's possible that's relevant that's germane um, and so if you step back and you say, you look at the solutions and the challenges, by the way, that are in our website, regeneration.org, you look at them and now imagine that there isn't a climatologist alive in the world. We don't have climate science. We have no idea what's causing extreme weather. Hurricane Ida was just like a super bummer, like, whoa, you know, more people drowned in New Jersey than Louisiana. Gosh, who knew? I mean, that that would ever happen. We have no idea that it was amplified by the warming waters in the Gulf, okay? We just don't make those connections. You look at every one of those solutions and we would want to do them. We do want to do them. We are doing them because they absolutely make everyone's lives better. Hello. It's like, it's like, and as opposed to it's like, I'm going to do this something because I feel like if I don't do it, we're screwed, you know, which if you look at it from that logic may be true, you know, but it's not a good entry point. It's not good motivation. And so um, the fact is that the way we talk about climate, the, first of all, is incorrect. It's incorrect in the sense we talk about addressing climate change, you use the word mitigate. Uh, I don't think people know what mitigate means when it comes to climate, uh, it, but it's it's in common parlance. I've asked people in audiences, you know, can somebody define mitigate for me? And they won't, you know, it's just, well, we'll mitigate, you know, but mitigate re means reduce the pain and seriousness of something. Well, is that what we want to do? We want to mitigate the pain and seriousness of, and then here's the thing, climate change. And there's another mistake, which is that somehow we think we can stop change. How fascinating. You cannot, you never will be able to, and you're not supposed to. Furthermore, the climate is supposed to change. It changes every nanosecond. And if we didn't change, we wouldn't have seasons. If we didn't have seasons, we wouldn't have rivers, glaciers, fish, you know, hummingbirds, honey, you know, dragonflies, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't have life as we know it if the climate wasn't changing constantly and so forth. And furthermore, uh, climate is perfect. It's always perfect, just as it is this moment, you know, it, because it's responding to what we're doing down here. That's what's going on. And so what we have to change is what we do, not trying to change the climate, you know. And so the problem with that language also is it's using othering language. In other words, it's othering the climate. And othering is the mental disease that it infects the whole world right now in terms of racism and sexism, in terms of uh, anti-Semitism and you know, Islamophobia, 
um, selfishness, you know, greed, uh, the Republican Party. I mean, othering the world is the cause of global warming, not the cure. And so it's the, the idea that things are separate and distinct and we can act in a way that is, you know, basically beneficial to us, but not to anything else is, is othering. And so the language we're using around it is, is that, well, here we go again. That is that, that all this means nothing. There's 4.3 billion people who are institutionally classified as living in impoverished conditions. Okay. That's World Bank. But there's a heck of a lot more than that. And what we've been talking about, Vicky, is like we have to address this future existential threat. You know, that's, that term is, use constantly well first of all it's not a future existential threat anymore but but even if even if it was the fact is that the overwhelming majority of people in the world wake up every morning with current existential threat they wake up and that's what's on their mind and that is their children getting to school food food security security period paying their rent warm enough you know i mean in, in their home and their clothing, getting things for their children. I mean, this is the plight of most people in the world. It's the plight of definitely 60 million plus people in the United States right now, where they even have a home next month. Uh, and, you know, uh, will they be homeless? Will they be this? Will they be that? I mean, and they have a child or two children and they don't, their car broke down, they don't have money, they can't get the, I mean, this is, this is the bulk of humanity. And, and so we have to understand that the, if we are not addressing current human need, then Katie bar the door, we will not reverse global warming. And, and so again, this conversation has to become much more inclusive. Regeneration has big, big, big arms, you know, whereas sustainability, mitigating, you know, combating, tackling, fighting climate change, is such a narrow uh, a way to see the world, to be in the world, to understand the world. First of all, it's incorrect, um, but it's using war and sports metaphors to describe something that we've created, you know. And so, uh, this is why I think regeneration um, is uh, a way of understanding oneself uh, uh, and oneself and oneself's relationship uh, that is so helpful. Um, and when, when I ask people to, people say to me, well, what should I do? You know, and I said, good question. And I used to be very disingenuous. I thought about it when Drawdown came out and I'd say, well, I don't know you, so I don't know what you should do, but actually should is the wrong verb, you know, uh, well, it's not a verb, but you know, it's part of the conjugation of the, of, of the verb do, and it's not, what do you want to do? <laughs> it's like, that's the question what lights you up what what is that that you want or are doing where you wake up in the morning going amazing it's another day <laughs> and i can go out and do what i love you know and I, i'll tell you a story about this because i just wrote a piece on insects you know which is for most people insects are a bother you know <laughs> like they don't want them around you know they bite they sting they get in fast they you know argentinian ants are crawling across your counter in the kitchen whatever you know they, that's what they think of insects okay understandable right you know but um what i've uh uh tried to show in there and which i haven't posted yet i can send it to you but um is that first of all they're a miracle uh, there's 1.4 billion insects for every human being on the planet. There's about a thousand pounds of biomass for every person of insects. And they're the base, they're the, the, uh, the food pyramid of the planet in terms of trophic cascades. They're the base, you know, they're the base. You take away the base, the whole thing falls apart. There is no uh, trophic cascade. There is no ecosystems. There are no uh, wetlands, there are no forests, there are no grasslands, they're, they're gone. And we're gone, of course, for sure. Uh, so it's just look at insects from that point of view. So there was a really interesting study that was done by the Creffield Society 
um, in uh, in Germany in, in in the Rhineland, and they had been studying amateurs. These are amateurs who just love bugs and insects, you know, and they've been studying them since 1905, and they have data they collect and they put them, you know, a little pin to them and formaldehyde in these boxes and stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, I did that as a kid, I remember well. And um, they're good. They're good at it. But they also trap in, uh, insects. And what they do is they put this big net, you know, like a, uh, on a car, okay? And then they drive the car down a highway <laughs> for so many minutes or, you know, uh, a day at certain times of the day. And they do it on the same highway or the same road uh year after year after year after year after year you know and then they then they weigh everything that's in the net uh and they calculate it and then make write it down in, in their in their preferred society you know um books and this and that you know they're scientists but they're not you know they're amateurs um but they're doing it scientifically so they came out in 2017 that said actually the 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 mass of flying insects is declined by 40 to 72 percent in the last 30 years and and it shocked the scientists looked at all their data and what they did and their methodology and said oh my god this is true this is true and they called that the insect apocalypse and the insect apocalypse then went around the world on the media because that's a you know curious phrase and um and then people came out from all over from asia south america and canada saying oh yeah we could here's our study here's our data these are amateurs too and and it was worldwide it's a worldwide phenomenon and i remember as a child we uh i lived with my grandparents and and and, and then later my aunt and uncle but i lived with them in the san joaquin valley in california we could not drive at night without having to stop every hour or so and scrape off all the gooey insect protein off the windshield. I mean, it was just splattered. Um, and uh, and you can drive down that road now, even 10 years ago or, or more, and your windshield's clear all night long, you know? And there, so that's called the windshield effect. The windshield effect is reported everywhere in the world. Um, and so, okay, so there's like, you know, the apocalyptic, does this scare the shit out of you kind of thing. <laughs> and, but what I wrote in it is like, wait a minute, let's go back. These are amateurs. What does amateur mean? An amateur is one who loves. That's an amateur. And in, in, in Latin is amateur, you know, I, I spent four years in tortured Latin classes, but I remember that word. And so the the people who loved these people did these studies because they loved insects, and they loved to identify them. They loved the diversity. You know, there's a million species of insects that are identified, and another seven they believe who are not identified yet. You know, million insects, and so it goes back to regeneration, which is really what we're talking about is loving the world that we. This is definitely an amateur hour thing. We are all amateurs at planet saving. So, and the way we do it is by falling in love. That's how we do it. And finding that thing that we love so much. It could be a person, it could be a place, it can be an inner city. Um, it can be butterflies. It can be water quality. It can be, you know, you know, it can be seaweed, you know, like it can be, um, restoring, you know, um, the beautiful, beautiful um, uh, marine forest that, that, that were offshore from British Columbia all the way down to Northern California, you know, uh, that Drake called one of the eighth wonder of the world when he got there, there's so much kelp and macroalgae algae and so forth and restoring those and restoring the balance, you know, to the sea urchin population that's destroying them and so forth. I mean, you it's out there somewhere, something's out there for you, you know, um, and you find that that's what you should, I can say no, no, that's what you should do because it lights you up and you do it well, you're learning, you're sharing and it grows, you know, and what we know from Andrew Huberman, who's a neurologist, a neuroscientist at Stanford and really brilliant. And he said, you know, 
Our beliefs do not change our actions. And we're trying to change people's beliefs about how the planet works and is it really, is it warming? Is it this, is it all this sort of stuff? You know, I mean, of course the overwhelming majority of people do understand, you know, that it is uh, anthropocentric, that is we're causing it, it's not just happenstance. But, you know, we're still thinking if we make people believe, you know, that they, you know, enough that they'll, they'll do something different. And it's not true. 2% of the world is doing something. 98% is totally disengaged from doing anything at all about global warming. And half of those people understand very well that it needs to be done and that, that, and that we're the cause or that we're the main cause, you know. And why is that? And the reason for that is that we haven't really created a, a playground big enough or fun enough and expansive enough and pertinent enough for them to want to do something they don't they just still think oh it's a car it's plastic you know it's cold water in my washing machine it's like okay i've got to you know basically oh i you know i shouldn't fly as much or you know i mean all that sort of stuff all things that don't light them up you know they say well, they're going to do it if they know how to do it or want to do it or care to do it we have to think about the other 98 percent of the people and why aren't they lit up why aren't they turned on so the regenerative solutions that we outline in this we, we add one almost every week from other people who help us but um are the things that everybody needs the world needs that benefits everybody it creates cleaner water better food more nutrition and foods food security you know creates better schools better education it creates you know, better schoolhouses, it creates, you know, uh, it, it reduces disease, you know, it, 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 it and as I said at the beginning, it, it, these things create purpose and meaning and dignity. And, 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 you know, like most people's now their jobs with all due respect, you know, don't provide that, you know, I mean, Amazon can run all the ads they want, but that is not really a job that gives you purpose and meaning in your life, you know. And, uh, and so you look at the way we have basically um, uh, the, the, the supply chains of the world to pr produce the things that you buy in Target and Walmart and everything like that. If you go down the supply chain, it's people doing very tedious, meaningless, repetitive work that is going to be roboticized, no question, and make them even less valuable. And, um, and there is a planet to be restored and to be regenerated just sitting it's an offering and the climate and global warming the climate disruption global warming is not a curse it's an offering you know nature never makes a mistake you know and so in a sense what we're getting from global warming and from extreme weather and all the uh, different impacts that has uh, is basically a, 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 a nudge from this beautiful thing we know as Earth, you know, that acts like a living system, it may be a living system. Uh, it certainly, we may never know uh, one way or the other. Um, it doesn't matter if we know, we know it acts like one and responds to one. That is one system, we know that. And as a system, um, it's giving us feedback and any system that ignores feedback, your body's a system, you know, feedback and you're going to die, you know, or die sooner. And so any feedback that comes in is a gift. It's an offering. It's the system talking to itself saying, you know, this isn't really working. <laughs> and I'm not trying to personify the earth as a system. I'm just saying, but in, in language, that's what feedback is saying, you know, which is, you want to pay attention to this thing because it's causing that thing. Um, and so when you go back to regeneration uh, as a way of understanding and seeing the world, it just gives you, like I said, a much broader, more detailed, more uh, granular, uh, more beautiful, more mysterious, more complex way of understanding uh, what's possible and w what your role can be in this possibility because the probabilities of climate have been just beaten into us you know? <laughs> like, and every day you, you 
you read the Guardian, you read this, you read that, whatever you read, you know, Times, the Post, you know, um, you, you just, okay, there's another bummer, there's another bummer, there's another one, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Okay, so those probabilities are good science. I don't question that. But the thing is that um, what we need to do is provide a, uh, the, what those probabilities point to, and they point to possibility. Every problem is a solution in disguise in disguise and so so the problem the problems we need to know and as they we learn more we need to get that information as well but but we need to also set them aside say thank you very much you know science wow amazing uh, but now i woke up today this is what i'm going to do i'm not going to wallow in the science i'm not going to you know have three four cups of coffee you know just because you know i'm so depressed uh, I'm going to actually go out and do things, you know, and do it with people I love and do it with so doing something I love. Uh, and I'm going to give my life meaning because I'm only here for a short time. No matter how old you are, it's a short time. And uh, so how am I going to spend the rest of my life, you know, and with whom am I going to spend it? And that could be not just humans, but with creatures and things that fly and buzz and burrow and swarm and you know, <laughs> and pat around four feet, you know, all that sort of stuff is and, and sing, you know. Uh, uh, and so this is our family and our family wants us to come home. It's like an aria. <laughs> it's not just a song. It's a symphony, Paul. It's just a total symphony. It, um, I have many, many notes, but I just gave up taking notes because, you know. You can listen to it again. <laughs> <laughs> really. Yeah. Um, I thank you so, so much. I, it's very inspiring at the moment because I'm working with a, a subset of the FIRE community. I don't know if you've ever heard yeah, of fire financial independence, retire early. Right. And we're we're we are recategorizing it as financial independence, regenerate everything. And the insight is that people don't want to not work; they want to work for something that's meaningful. Exactly. And that you know, for me, that's totally revived my interest in that work and that community. That this is a group of people who's done the adulting work of like examining their relationship with money and digging themselves out of the system that's deadening them, you know, but they haven't been, they don't see what you're talking about. They don't see the work ahead as a, let me edit. <laughs> you can't stop me. And so I'm really excited to share your words with uh, that community because the fire community is very, very large. It's global. It's just an amazing um, phenomenon. So I'm totally with you. The only other thing I would say is that when I was writing my book on local food, um, I realized that it, there was no such thing as local food. There was only relationship. There was only like, you know, food wasn't in the store. It wasn't in my garden. It was that I was an animal that had forgotten how to eat. And, um, and so, you know, that's my, one of my mottos for my tombstone. It's a relational world. Yeah. And I think we've forgotten that. I think we, and it's a great, terrible loneliness, just like the bugs on the windshield. You know, it's a terrible loneliness that we're not having to scrape them off. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, it's, it's basically the other part of it is that, that humans are part of the living system. You know, this is the living systems of this earth are speaking through us as well. You know, we're migrating, we're circling up, you know, and that's what I sort of have derived from this part of your work is, is that we can not sit back and trust, but we can trust that that which is alive in the world is alive in us and that we can allow it to move us, you know, as you're saying, you know, out of love, but also, you know, physically move us. I mean, we... We're part of that climate change. We're part of the changing earth. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are, whether they're financially self-sufficient or, you know, smart or adult or not, there are people who are moving. It's, um, uh, 
uh, Jason McLennan of the Living Building Challenge, you know, used the term Zugenruch, which is that moment when a herd of animals, enough heads have turned in the direction um, of, you know, away from danger or toward food. And then the whole herd moves. So, you know, it's like, I think what you're saying is that we can have faith in ourselves as well. It doesn't mean to sit back and have faith or have faith in Nestle's or, you know, whoever, but we can have faith that whatever it is that's alive in everything is alive in us. So that's my superfluous um, coda to your aria. And um, I really want to thank you for this. I find it immensely inspiring as usual that you no, yes, provide yes. a context for us to live into that seems both possible and impossible you know it just right. seems obvious but you know like wait a second <laughs> you know it's like how do we do it but it's just obvious that it can be done yeah, yeah. hey thanks for listening don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review so that this hopeful message can get out to more people Check out Post Carbon Institute's Resilience website for show notes and for more guest information. Thanks also to Asher Miller, Amy Burringrood, and Clara Winter of Post Carbon Institute, plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com. <laughs>